with an estimated cost set to exceed over $1.7 trillion. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is the most expensive defense acquisition in history. But a damning report that emerged in 2015 showed that it couldn't even hold its own in a dogfight against the F-16. Ever since then, tough guys on the internet have been quick to point out that the F-35 can't dogfight. But is that true? Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. We've talked a lot about dogfights or air combat maneuvering on this channel, and for good reason. It's not at all uncommon to hear fighter pilots today dismiss the importance of air combat maneuvering altogether, highlighting modern sensor reach and extremely effective long-range air-to-air weapons as reasons you just won't see theatrics like Mavericks in a real cockpit anytime soon, anyway. The fact of the matter is, advanced beyond visual range weapons really will extend air combat ranges further than ever before. But air combat technology has been developing in a relative vacuum for decades now. And there's an inherent danger to that. It is, after all, worth noting that America's only dogfight in more than two decades was in the uncontested airspace over Syria against a 50-year-old attack aircraft. Now, to be clear, I say that without even the hint of disrespect intended for Lieutenant Commander Michael Tremel, who scored that air-to-air -air kill in 2017 against a Syrian Air Force Su-22 in his Super Hornet. That short engagement offered us an important lesson about bridging the gap between long-standing air power and the cutting-edge systems that are being fielded by the United States today. Because when Tremel locked on to that Soviet-era Su-22 and pulled the trigger with one of the Navy's latest and greatest air-to-air -air weapons, the AIM-9X, the Su-22 deployed flares, and it worked. That 50-year-old bucket of flares managed to fool what is widely considered to be one of, if not the most advanced infrared-guided air-to-air missile in service today. Of course, the fight didn't end there. Tremel switched to the older AIM-120 radar-guided AMRAAM and fired again, this time finding his target and turning the Su-22 into a fireball. Now, there's been no official explanation as to what happened with that AIM-9X, but some experts have postulated that it may have been because the AIM-9X was designed to be able to differentiate between the latest and most advanced flares and top-of-the-line fourth- and fifth-generation fighters. The Su-22's been flying since 1966, and its dirty old bucket of flares were just something the AIM-9X never expected to run into. Now, there are a million variables in combat, and this all isn't to say that the AIM-9X can't be used to engage dated platforms, but it is a good reminder that air combat theory doesn't necessarily dictate air combat reality. For those of us who have either read about or actually lived through the war in Vietnam, this isn't an unfamiliar debate. Now, I've actually written pretty extensively on what went wrong with America's approach to air combat in the Vietnam War. And the truth is, it's actually a lot more complicated and nuanced than most people tend to think. If you're interested in a video on it, let me know. I'd love to do one. But suffice to say, there's reasonable precedent to argue that America tends to get the future of air combat wrong when theorizing about it in a relative vacuum. As many of you are well aware, our air combat woes over Vietnam not only led to reincorporating guns into our tactical fighters, but also the establishment of the Navy's Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor Program, which most of us would know as Top Gun, as well as the Air Force's Red Flag exercises, which are widely considered to be among the most realistic air combat exercises in the world. So what does this all have to do with the F-35? Well, the F-35 leans heavily into the prevailing wisdom of today that dogfights are a thing of the past. Its design prizes data fusion and computing power, along with low observability, over the hot rod performance we found in fighters of previous eras, jets like the F-15. In fact, the F-35B and C, specialized for service aboard amphibious assault ships and aircraft carriers, are limited to just short supersonic sprints of less than six 
60 seconds in order to protect their delicate radar-absorbent coating, which is layered over the airframes. Meanwhile, Cold War speedsters like the F-16 can creep up toward Mach 2 when flying without ordnance, and the legendary F-15 can do better than Mach 2.5 when it needs to hustle. Of course, top speed doesn't actually mean much when it comes to practical applications, whether we're talking fighters or cars for that matter. What really tends to make the difference, both in racing and in dogfighting, tends to be things like acceleration, power-to-weight ratios, and your ability to handle a turn. And the fact of the matter is, the F-35's performance in these areas also falls short of fourth-generation jets like the F-15 or F-16. This shift in philosophy, exemplified by the F-35's focus on technology over hard performance, has led many to question just how effective it could be in a near-peer conflict against not only other stealth fighters, but also highly capable fourth-generation jets that managed to sneak in close enough to scrap. Russia's fifth-generation Su-57 may exist in so few numbers that it might as well be a mirage, but the nation's fourth-generation fighters, like the highly capable thrust-vectoring Su-35, are really something to behold at airshows. Their thrust-vectoring aerobatics make for a much more dynamic display than the F-35's speak-softly-and-carry-a-technological-stick design. But what does that actually mean for air combat? If you judge the F-35 using the same rubric we've used to judge fourth generation and previous fighters, it really seems like it wouldn't stand a chance in a one-on-one -on -one brawl with just about any advanced platform out there. And there are plenty of folks on the internet who really seem to believe that. And to be fair, those folks in the F-35 can't dogfight camp do come with receipts in the form of a now infamous report published in 2015 by a journalist named David Axe for War is Boring. The story was based on an official DoD report that Axe got his hands on that outlines how the F-35 got its tail kicked over and over again by the F-16 in air combat maneuvering trials. The exercises reportedly took place on January 14th of 2015 over the Sea Test Range, which is a stretch of the Pacific Ocean near Edwards Air Force Base in California. This report and Axe's coverage of it has been the smoking gun for F-35 haters ever since. And while the report itself is legitimate, I'm going to break down why it was also sort of bunk. The fight was between a modern F-16D Block 40 and an Air Force F-35A. Now, the F-35A is the Runway Queen Joint Strike Fighter. It requires a full-length runway for takeoffs and landings, unlike the short takeoff vertical landing F-35B or the carrier-capable C. The F-35A is also the only of the three Joint Strike Fighter iterations to carry an onboard cannon the 25mm GAU-22A, which is a four-barrel Gatling gun. And because of the presence of this gun and the fact that the F-35A is the lightest of the Joint Strike Fighter family, you could really contend that it was the best-suited iteration of the F-35 for this trial. I'll go ahead and quote an unnamed F-35 test pilot from the report. The evaluation focused on the overall effectiveness of the aircraft in performing various specified maneuvers in a dynamic environment. This consisted of traditional basic fighter maneuvers in offensive, defensive, and neutral setups at altitudes ranging from 10,000 to 30,000 feet. So far, it really does sound like this exercise was designed to test the F-35 in a variety of circumstances and to make sure that no single victory could be a fluke. The F-35A carried no external munitions or fuel tanks, just like it wouldn't in combat in order to maintain its stealth profile, while the F-16 did carry external tanks. Not to pile on Axe's reporting, I don't know the guy, but he identifies this as an advantage the F-35 had in the test, but the truth is, that's an advantage fifth-generation platforms just have in a fight with a fourth-generation aircraft. And lest you think I'm being unfair here, you should know that it would be really unusual for a fifth-generation jet, regardless of which one, to fly into contested airspace carrying external munitions or fuel tanks. It just runs counter to the premise of using a stealth fighter in the first place. If you're going to carry external munitions, you might as well use a much cheaper platform like the F-16, the F-15, or the F-A-18. 
But nonetheless, so far, so good. There are no glaring problems with this exercise. And once the fighting kicked off, the F-35 seemed to immediately struggle, proving unable to line up the Viper in its sights for notional gun runs due to what the pilot called sluggish performance. Or, as the report put it, even with the limited F-16 target configuration, the F-35A remained at a distinct energy disadvantage for every engagement. The report goes on to say that in offensive and defensive duels, the F-35 was consistently found wanting, due in large part to its inability to get its nose pointed at its opponent. I'll quote the F-35 pilot here. Instead of catching the bandit off guard by rapidly pulling aft to achieve lead, the nose rate was slow, allowing him to easily time his jink prior to the gun's solution. Now, for those of you who don't speak fluent airplane nerd, what the F-35 pilot was effectively saying is that the jet's nose would orient towards its target so slowly that the F-16 pilot was able to time it and just move out of the way every time he tried to fire. And that same nose rate issue came back to haunt the F-35 when the tides were turned. It allowed the F-16 to quickly gain a firing solution, while the F-35 struggled to get itself out of the way of the Viper's cannon. According to the report, there was only one way the F-35 could win a duel with the Fighting Falcon, and it was by putting itself into an extreme maneuver that gave it the chance to point its nose at its opponent and deliver a missile shot. But in doing so, the report explained, it robbed the F-35 of airspeed, leaving it vulnerable to a follow-on attack. I'll quote the report here. The technique required a commitment to lose energy and was a temporary opportunity prior to needing to regain energy and ultimately end up defensive again. This report and the accompanying context provided by Axe in his coverage really seemed to suggest that the F-35 is seriously inferior to older jets like the F-16. And from there, the internet just did what the internet does best, and this story snowballed throughout the web until just about everybody was talking about how the F-35 can't dogfight. It wasn't until later that the real details about this series of exercises emerged, and those details dramatically changed the way these fights should be characterized. But by then, the damage was already done. The internet had already decided that the F-35 can't dogfight. But let's take a minute to talk about all the context that this report and Axe's coverage of it were missing. Because while the internet at large is probably not going to change its mind, you can walk away a bit better informed anyway. The internet at large loved this story because it seemed to confirm what many were already starting to believe about Lockheed Martin's Joint Strike Fighter program, playing into the increasingly popular narrative that this $1.7 trillion effort has not only been financially bloated and ripe with delays, but also ultimately resulted in an unimpressive aircraft that fails to meet expectations. Of course, we've discussed in the past about the difference between the acquisition boondoggle that is the F-35 program and the incredibly capable platform that is the F-35 jet. Among the more aviation astute among you, one glaring red flag may already be waving. It came about halfway through Axe's original article, when he explained how the F-35 had to use that specific maneuver to orient its nose at the F-16 in order to score its one and only missile kill. It very clearly sounds like the pilot was working hard to get his aircraft to find a target, but... The F-35, notably, does not need to orient its nose at a target in order to lock onto it with a missile. In fact, the F-35 famously can use its helmet-mounted queuing system, distributed aperture system, and the AIM-9X to fire at aircraft off-bore or directly behind it. So what gives? Why would an aircraft with such advanced sensor fusion capabilities that the pilot can literally look through the fuselage to target opponents actually need to aim its nose at the F-16 at all? Well, it turns out it's because the F-35 was flying with both wings digitally tied behind its back. 
The F-35A airframe used in the exercise, known as AF-2, was among the earliest F-35s delivered to the Air Force, and it carried software limitations that were specifically intended to prevent the pilot from pushing the jet anywhere near its structural limits. The F-16D it was flying against, of course, had no such restrictions, but that's definitely not all. In a subsequent piece penned by Chris Osborne for the National Interest, the reasons for the F-35's poor dogfighting performance began to take shape. Osborne reached out to the F-35's Joint Program Office to find out what really happened, and I'll tell you how they responded. The F-35 involved was AF-2, which is an F-35 designed for flight sciences testing or flying qualities of the aircraft. It is not equipped with a number of items that make today's production F-35s fifth-generation fighters. So, why wasn't the F-35 able to aim and fire notional missiles at its F-16 opponent without pointing its nose directly at it? The answer is simple. The F-35 that participated in these drills didn't have the systems it needed to leverage its own capabilities. The F-35 office spelled it out succinctly. The AF-2 was not equipped with the weapons or software that allow the F-35 pilot to turn, aim a weapon with the helmet, and fire at an enemy without having to point the airplane at its target. The AF-2 F-35 used in these dogfights also didn't come with radar-absorbent coatings that are essential for the stealth profile of these jets. In fact, current radar-absorbing materials, as we've discussed in the past, are rated to absorb upwards of 70 to 80 percent of inbound electromagnetic energy, or radar waves, which would have made it much more difficult for the F-16 to track the F-35 on radar. The fact of the matter is, the F-35 that participated in these exercises was flying with software intentionally meant to limit its aerobatic performance. It was flying without the F-35's advanced avionics suite that allows it to target an opponent, and it was flying with its stealth profile compromised. And if you're looking for confirmation of that, look no further than 2017, when the F-35A made its debut in the Air Force's Red Flag exercises. Despite the fact that the F-35 was primarily leveraged to coordinate aircraft in these exercises, according to Lieutenant General Jerry D. Harris, the vice commander of Air Combat Command at the time, F-35As still came home with a 20 to 1 combat record, meaning for every one F-35 shot down in these exercises, F-35s shot down 20 enemy fighters. And that same day, in February of 2017, U.S. Marine Lieutenant General John M. Davis reported that the Marine Corps' F-35B recorded an even more astonishing 24 to 0 kill ratio during a different series of exercises. Now, these are just exercises, and we should always take these figures with a grain of salt, but it seems more than evident that that 2015 report that the internet just loves wasn't actually an accurate depiction of the F-35's air-to-air -air chops. And that actually makes a lot of sense to me, seeing as I've talked to a lot of fighter pilots in the last few years, and not a one of them has told me they'd rather fly into a fight in a 50-year-old F-16 than an F-35. The truth is, the F-35 just doesn't operate like any fighter jet we've ever seen before, so trying to grade it on the same scale we've used for past platforms just doesn't give you a very realistic idea of its capabilities. Is it true that dogfighting is dead? I'd contend no. And even though the F-35's design philosophy does not prioritize hot rod dogfighting performance, the evidence seems to suggest that if it finds itself in such a fight, putting your money on the joint strike fighter is probably a pretty smart bet. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.